And, um, and it's sad, but you know, that one of the things uh, that we do is that we say, you know, what are the things that made those things happen? That's a real perfect storm that comes together. So we have to identify what those things are and make sure that we don't allow one thing to lead to another to lead to another and have that kind of explosion of violence that occurred in 1992 and 19, 1965. And capacity building, you know, the truth is for this to, to take hold, it's culture change we're talking about, culture of peace. You know, it's going to take a long-term uh, change to make this, uh, to, to bring about the kind of long-lasting change in our world that we need. So that means working with institutions, um, not just schools, but city government, police departments. We do lots of police training. We work with police to work with civil rights groups to come together. Um, so all of that is, is critical to our work, and, and I think a critical lesson for, for the world. You know, people lo you know, often react to, to big crisis by saying, okay, let's take a break, let's have an assembly, and let's all talk about this. Lots of talking, lots of talking. But in the end, unless there are changes that occur in everyday practices in those institutions, you're, not, you're making very incremental change, such minimal change that it's almost, it can be gone in a few years. And that's particularly true with schools, but certainly in workplaces as well. One of the things I wanted to point out too is that, you know, um, it's easy for us in, in, in the world we live in to um, believe that the thing that is of most important is the material gain that we can get. In other words, that we're in a relationship with someone, we are trying to figure out, okay, what can we get out of this relationship? And sometimes we just are so short-term goal-oriented that we're going to just say, okay, um, I think that if I can make a deal with this person and this person's out, we'll be able to do more. Like, we can benefit ourselves more effectively. It's always more complicated when you have more people. Democracy is very messy. But what a, a, mess a message that I think is critical is to understanding that this is about a time of relationships. And the truth is, that's what social and emotional intelligence is about. If you can actually build a relationship with somebody, you're going to get much more in the long term in terms of value than if you win a, a short-term gain and you exclude a person who doesn't offer you anything today, but it really should be part of the equation. And you don't include them, you run the risk of, of being later in a position where you don't have that relationship that you can call upon. Um, and that's something that actually leaders are being trained to do, to not be so short-term oriented about what they can gain, but to understand that this is something much larger. And I think in terms of a lesson from and for a global LA, it, respect means uh, mutual respect means that you're going to um, key on relationship building. You're going to key on power sharing as opposed to power control. Instead of turning the tables, you're going to share the table, going to open the table up. And I think that kind of trust and positive relationship that you can build is critical to actually changing the way we, the way we view the world. Um, people say, how do you know how things are in LA? And the truth is it's not that easy. If you read the media stories, what do you mostly get? Crime. Crime. You get conflict, because that's the stuff that makes the, the, the news media. So you get, you know, Crash, the movie Crash, in a sense that is highlighting, you know, a lot of conflict in a short time period. Not to say that stuff doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen all in two or three days. Um, school data. You can get it when you can get it, but it's tough to get. And that often is very poorly reported. So that can't necessarily tell you how things are going. It tells, of course, it's just about our youth population, but... You could discrimination complaint. Well, that tells you who's filing complaints, but does that, you know, is that an indicator of, of really how well we're doing in society? It's one indicator, but I wouldn't say it tells a whole story either. I talked about the rate of interethnic marriage or multiracial persons. That certainly is a concrete indicator, but again, just a piece of the puzzle. And hate crime stats, I wanted to point this out to you because it's one of the things that we specialize in. Just to be clear, hate crime, first of all, has to be a crime. It cannot be a dirty look, it cannot be an epithet thrown, it's got to be a crime. And then on top of that, you've got to show the motivation behind it is based on a person's you know, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, race, gender, uh, religion, gen uh, disability. Those are, the, uh, those are the bases. It has to be one of those things. It can't be because that person you know, is wearing, I don't know, a Boston Celtics t-shirt, for example. Go on. Okay. This is the hate crimes uh, totals year by year. We're, we've been doing this longer than almost any other agency in the United States. 1980 we started doing this. You can see that the numbers were very low. But as you might imagine, it didn't mean we have very few hate crimes. 
it meant that the reporting system was very immature, that a lot of agencies did not report. People didn't report because they didn't know they should be reporting hate crime. But then in the 90s, you can see, we hit sort of a plateau. We were, you know, basically established our, our 46 police agencies plus a whole host of other groups where when you don't want to report to a police agency, you can report to. And, um, and then we had our huge spike in uh, 2001, 9-11. After 9-11, the, the amount of his, uh, scapegoating and attacks on people who looked Middle Eastern or Muslim was historic. And that caused that huge bump up, 1,031, the highest total we've ever had. But since then, in 2000, I'd like to report that, you know, we've dropped. Now, the headline, of course, when, in the recent uh, hate crime report we released is that it's up 28% to 763. And it's the highest it's been in the past five years. Bad news. And it's, it's going up at a time when crime, general crime, has went down in 2007 from 2006. So it's contrary to the general tr uh, crime trend. Um, so what's going on with that? We don't know all that's going on with it. We get the numbers reported to us, and we're looking at the communities involved, and we know that there's a lot of, um, that the violence increased across the board. Racial, ethnic, uh, national origin hate crime, the largest category, experienced a significant increase. Sexual orientation hate crime, significant increase. Uh, religious hate crime, significant increase. So it wasn't just one of those categories, it's in all those categories. I'm not sure what's driving it, why it's happening in all across the board, but it's coming that way and it's coming from different parts of the county. It's not just in one certain part. Why do we care about hate crime? It really is just, it's, it's very extreme behavior. You know, 763 hate crimes is really a small number for a county our size. On the other hand, um, we know that it's part of a larger pyramid of hate in the sense that people commit hate crimes when they feel like there is an atmosphere where, you know, at least it could be tolerated or supported. Somebody is giving you the idea that it's okay to shout these epithets or to attack someone or target someone because of their, of their characteristics. Those prejudiced attitudes sit at the bottom of it. You move up, there's acts of prejudice that could be non-criminal. And then you've got discrimination, which it can be non-criminal as well. But then you get into violence. And then at the pyramid, the top of the pyramid, of course, is genocide. So if you allow uh, violence to basically become the way you deal with differences between groups, then it can lead to the extreme. As I said, you know, LA County, a big place. You don't see Antelope Valley here, but rest assured they have their dots too. These are hate crimes from 2003 to 2007, and you can see they are pretty much scattered throughout the county. No community is immune from hate crime. Um, and you'll see clusters that, that develop uh, in different parts of the county um, that sometimes correspond to different targeted populations. For example, you'll see a lot of sexual orientation hate crime in West Hollywood and Hollywood because that's a strong, you know, uh, established gay community, and people will actually go there and carry out attacks. Um, and you'll see that, you know, there's a great variety of, uh, in the valley and, and in South LA and San Gabriel Valley, um, Santa Clarita Valley, there's a great variety of, of types of hate crime. It's not just one type. You'll see targeting of, of all sorts of groups. Let's go to the next one. And it, as I said, it breaks down pretty much the same throughout the county uh, and, the, and the state. The vast majority, 68%, um, are, are race, ethnic, national origin based hate crimes. The next slice is religion, uh, or, or sexual orientation hate crime, which is about 17, 18%. And then the next largest slice is religious-based hate crime, which is uh, 15%. And then disability and gender, very small reporting of it. Part of it's because I think law enforcement in the case of gender has never come up with the definition of gender-based hate crime, which they, you know, which has been bought into. Um, and there's a great divide about you know, what you characterize as gender-based hate crime. And disability, because the same thing, there's, there's I think, lack of reporting. 